Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galo, making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale galu, we know say you drop the money from, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Hello, everyone, and welcome to AK Festival Online. Um, my name is Emmanuel Akimotu. I'm a journalist at The Guardian covering West Africa. Um, and I'm calling from Lagos, Nigeria. And speaking today, um, I have the, the real pleasure to talk to Derek Korusu, who is a British Ghanaian writer based in North London. Um, uh, his debut novel, That Reminds Me, won the Desmond Elliott Prize this year. Um, and it's a really kind of beautiful novel. There's a kind of mosaic of the life of a character called Kay. But I, I can't read you the book justice, obviously. I, I would implore everyone to read it. Um, but it's a pleasure to talk to Derek about it. Um, uh, yeah, and so like, welcome, Derek. Thank you. Yeah, how are you today, anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, not too bad. Um, just been working all morning. I'm trying to finish a poetry collection I'm working on at the moment, actually. Mm -hmm. So I've just been um, really trying hard to 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 get through that. Um, and then once that's done, then the editing process begins, which will probably take me about a year. Mm. You know, for me, the, the editing is always longer than the actual writing itself. Um, and I usually dread it, dread editing, but, you know, that's 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 the game I've decided to get into. So. Yeah, the, the thought of editing for a year is, is mad. Um, what's like, you've not come through, I mean, people come to their professions in different ways, but definitely you've not come to writing in an orthodox way. Um, Maybe you can kind of talk about your background um, as a writer. How did like writing um, and, and even that like, literature begin for you um, as something that you were in love with? So I've, I've been writing. So I used to write like lyrics and things like that because, you know, I went through that whole adolescent stage of wanting to be a rapper. Mm -hmm. uh, so I used to write a lot of lyrics, pages and pages and pages of lyrics. But I wasn't, I wasn't any good at rapping. I mean, because I was writing so much I was trying to cram too much into like one bar um, and it just didn't sound right. I was just always falling off the beat and things like that. So but I carried on writing lyrics, even though I, I wasn't going to rap them. And then that kind of turned into poetry, but just just poetry for myself. You know, we all, well, I think a lot of people just write things for themselves that they don't plan for anybody to see. And they just, they store it in a folder on their, on their laptop, their computer or whatever. Or in their phone, a lot of time I find as well. Mm -hmm. So I, wasn't taking that seriously and then when i went to university uh but i think I was, I was 24 when i went to university um i went very late and i wasn't interested in, in literature i i'd never read a book cover to cover in my life it just it just seemed like work to me and i wasn't very academically inclined i didn't like school or anything like that what were you what were you doing at uni what i was studying exercise science so because i was a personal trainer at the time and i was um i was trying to be a professional bodybuilder and i wanted to train athletes so I was kind of forced to go to uni when I was 24. I didn't think I could do it. So I didn't go at 18 because I just didn't think I was smart enough. Mm -hmm. My cousin managed to, I guess he coerced me into going realistically. Mm -hmm. And then I went mm -hmm. and I had a research methods lecturer who said, you guys are going to have to read a lot of scientific journals. You know, a lot of people think sports science is practical. He's like, there's going to be zero practical stuff on this on this degree it's all science so it's like get used to reading research papers and to do this he said go down to the library just pick out some classics and read them and get into the the flow of reading non-stop throughout this course and i just thought okay cool whatever um and i went to the library and i picked up a book of short stories by dh lawrence i was not looking forward to it. i was just like i can't bother to do this but let me give it a try i read it and you know, as cliche as it sounds, it changed my life. I read it and I was just mind blown. I was like, I was like, this is literature. This is what reading is like. I can't believe I've been missing out on this. And I just became obsessed with reading. Absolutely obsessed. I just started going through the classics, then reading more contemporary um, literature. Then I started reading YA. Then I just mm. went to so many different types of books. And it was just such a great experience. It made, it made Unity such an enriching experience for me. Mm. And I don't think I would have been able to graduate 
if I wasn't reading so much because when I went to uni, like I didn't even know what a semicolon was. I didn't know anything. <clears throat> I didn't know about grammar or anything like that because I just I never needed to because I left school. I didn't go to sixth form and I just I just started working or I was just dossing around doing nothing with my life. Um, so when I, when I was reading, I was unconsciously picking up grammar, grammatical structures and things like that. So when I was writing, so a lot of the time when I'm writing, I just know where things go, even though I haven't actually studied. Uh, well, I have now, but then I just knew where things would go. And luckily, my I wasn't very good at scientific writing because it's a very specific kind of writing. This I hate scientific writing. Um, and then, yeah, luckily my lecturers were kind of like, okay, you're, you're writing very well, but you know, we'll give you, we'll give you a two, one here or, or two, a two, two there, but you need to change your style because it, it feels like you're telling us a story and it's not objective. We need objective writing. So managed to get through uni that way, managed to get a first at the end of it. And then after that, while I was in uni, I was writing kind of like just now and then for like online, online publication, just reviewing books. So I was just reading so much. I just wanted to review them and talk to other people about them. Mm. And I never took writing seriously until about two years ago when um, I, um, you know, I was out with another writer. We was just, we was just talking uh, in a bar, uh, a writer called Jeremy Adegoke. She mm. co for a book called Slain Your Lane. Yeah. And, um, we had exchanged some WhatsApp messages and she was just like, you know, tell me about your life. Cause at the time I was doing an English literature podcast, she had come on and we were just talking and she said, you know, from the WhatsApp messages you sent me, like you can write, you write really well. And I was just kind of like, really? She's like, yeah, you, she was like, you are a writer. She's like, I can just tell you are a writer. Mm -hmm. So she won, she had the idea for a book called safe, which was an anthology of 20 black British men. She said, take this idea. Mm -hmm. I'll help you get an agent and get this book published. Um, and that's what happened. That's what happened. Um, and the rest is the rest is history. I mean, the story for that reminds me is is quite long as well, actually. So well, we, we can talk about that later. But um, but yeah, that's, that's that's how I got into writing. That's that's amazing. There's a lot. Um, obviously, that would be great to get into. Um, I'm calling you. Where, where are you at the moment? I'm in London. In London, okay. Uh, so, and and I'm 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 in Lagos, um, and um, but also from from London. Which part of London are you from? Uh, North London, Tottenham. London. Oh, cool. Um, we used to like. Obviously, there's a. I'm not sure if you kind of grew up around this whole like South Londoners thinking North Londoners are weird in some way. But yeah, uh, I'll try not to transmit that. <laughs> <thing>. Um. <laughs> um one one of the things so with, with that reminds me obviously you published safe first which um as you said is an anthology uh and that that i guess came out before you started writing that reminds me or how did that remind you get into the timeline of you of you writing yeah yeah safe came out um before that reminds me i wasn't even writing it at, well no i was kind of writing it at the time but with, without any means of publishing it without thinking about publishing it. Mm. You know, I started writing it when I was in a mental health facility after I suffered like a serious breakdown mm. and got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Mm. Um, I started writing that reminds me then. Mm. And um, I was working full time at Penguin Random House at the time and I knew one of the editors who had helped set up Murky Books, which is Stormzy's imprint at Penguin. Mm. And we were just talking and he was kind of like, okay, so you've done safe. What's next for you? What, what have you got planned? And I was just telling him about some projects I was doing. One of them was a project with my little brother and he was excited by this idea. He said, this would be a great book. You know, I was planning to do a podcast, but he said, this would be a great book. I said to him, well, I have been writing poetry, been writing this kind of um, long prose poem, I guess I was calling it at the time. Um, but he was just kind of like, okay, you know what? Um, go and meet Stormzy's manager. Talk to her about the book with your brother first, and then we can take it from there. Mm -hmm. So before I met Stormzy's manager, I sent her some of my uh, writing just so she could get a taste of my writing style, see if she was she was into it or not. Mm -hmm. I with her, and she was really into the the prose poem that I was writing, mm -hmm. you know. And I said, "Well, the editor's into this book with my little brother," and she was just kind of like, "Okay, we'll sort it out." Mm -hmm. um, and then luckily, I, I they offered me a two book deal. Yeah. With, that reminds me coming out first and then 
the second book to be published um, later down the line. So that's amazing, man. A lot to unpack there. Like with your music, you initially you were writing lyrics when you were younger. Um, what was music like to you when you were like when you were younger, and how much is that an aspect of how you write now? And maybe kind of concurrently with that is like if you're you're you you are drawn more and have been drawn more to to the expression and the language even more than the plots when you were kind of coming into that and and maybe kind of you can kind of like speak to like what it is that literature serves for you on an emotional level in terms of the that relationship between expression um, uh, against like a plot or just the narrative. Yeah, um, so I mean, sort of part of the question in terms of music. Um, I mean, music is, is important to everybody. I wouldn't say that it's, I wouldn't say I couldn't live without it because I go months and months without listening to music sometimes. Mm. Um, when I'm writing, I do like to listen to something before I put pen to paper. Um, but yeah, when I was younger, it was just because I, you know, I was really into like Nas and when it was, it was when grime was really coming into itself. So it was, it was an exciting time for music and everybody wanted to be a part of it. I would be a part of it. I to, you know, be a grime MC or a rapper or whatever. Um, so that, that's that's the point. But in terms of my writing, I don't, it's weird. It's not music that's in my mind when I'm writing, but it's, it, there's still rhythm and, 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 and tones. It's just, it's not, it's, it's, it's difficult to explain. I, I know it makes sense in my head. <laughs> they're split in my mind, but it's difficult to articulate. Like I said, I'm more drawn to, to, to language and I guess character studies, books mm -hmm. that examine people. I think that if you're examining a person in a book, there, there is a plot, a plot will develop by itself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Things will eventually happen, even if they're happening in the mind of the character. Mm -hmm. Things are connecting, things are moving forward or going in different directions. That's, that's a plot to me anyway. And if you write a character very well anyway, it all just takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say I don't like books that are very, very uh, plot driven. I do, you know, I enjoy all kinds of books, but mm -hmm. just from where I started in my reading, I, you know, I started with like the, the classics and things like that. A lot of those books are not very plot heavy. Mm -hmm. So that's just, that's just how my taste has developed because of where I started. I imagine if I started reading younger, like as a child, books that are very, very plot heavy. That mm -hmm. may be my preference, but mm -hmm. that's just my mm -hmm. When you, um, and, and even like with poetry, because like, as you said, you're, you, you, you are really taken by poetry and your books are, are really poetic. Um, uh, and your writing style is, is, is really like, it's poetic prose, right? Um, and what, what, how is that, you know, when you are kind of developing you, as, a, as a writer, um, whether did you have, especially as like, like a young black male writer, like kind of not necessarily always in a writing space, but coming from a different field and kind of navigating that yourself, what were the things that you kind of saw, or was there anyone that you saw like as a reference point, like on the literary scene in the UK, or, or did you kind of feel like writing and even like the process of it and the space you were in mentally was like a, was more of a kind of insular personal space. Yeah, I definitely feel like it was a personal space um, because I'm just a fan of authors in general, and they were they always felt quite distant from me. So even though I've interviewed a lot of authors on on the podcast that I did with Mostly Lit, mm -hmm. um, I never felt like I could reach out to any writer or anything like that. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, but there, there was one writer who really supported me. Um, uh, before I was even published, uh, an author called Musa Kwanga, he's been really supportive of my journey. You know, I reached out to him for safe and he was just like, yep, we're going to do this. Let's get this published. You know, he was the first person to read that reminds me and he, no, not even that reminds me as it was finished, just some sections of it. And, you know, he gave me advice, some tips and he was just like, this is going to be published. Like, it's, you know, he had a lot of faith in, in what I was doing. So yeah, yeah, definitely him. You know, um, it was it was it was tough because you know you, I did ask a few people some questions and they just kind of, just kind of fobbed me off with just generic answers like they're not interested. You know, they must get a lot of people coming up to them saying, you know, I want to be a writer, so they probably just saw me as oh another one of these annoying 
young people saying they want to be a writer, but do they have what it takes? You know, mm -hmm. so was the one who actually listened when I when I said this to him. Mm -hmm. Then and like with murky books, I mean, that's kind of how do you kind of see how that came at such a kind of specific time in your kind of your writing journey as well. Mm -hmm. like, we can talk about how it is and it's it almost seems like such a strike stroke of luck that that came in a way that your journey as a writer as a breakthrough award-winning writer now has kind of meant that you haven't gone through the kind of mainstream largely white writing establishment in the uk so much maybe you can kind of speak to that a bit yeah absolutely um and i mean not just that because you know the poetry scene is very small in in london especially and a lot of the poets have been on the poetry circuit for years and years and years. Um, and then here I come, just on some, oh yeah, I got a book deal. <laughs> I'm a poet right away, you know. It created a weird dynamic between me and, and some poets. I, I I think, I mean, writers are competitive by, by nature anyway. You know, they want to be the best. If, if any writer says that they're not trying to be the best or better than others, I, I think they're lying. Um, there's always that competitiveness within them. Mm -hmm. Because you spend so long on perfecting your craft of, I mean, of course you want it to be excellent. Of course you want mm -hmm. people to say, this is amazing. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to go through a lot of hardships, you know, in terms of doors being slammed in my face and people saying you're not good enough and all of that kind of thing. I'm very grateful for that. And as you say, I've been very lucky and I'm happy to acknowledge that. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I know writers now and it hasn't been easy for them to get published. Mm -hmm. I know you've spoken a lot uh, in the past um, about your personal journey and how that sits parallel to the stories that you write in this and the journey of Kay in That Reminds Me. Um, yeah, so just uh, give us a sense of how this, how this began um, and um, what that's been like. I began it as a sort of self-interrogation, uh, trying to understand what leads a person to have a mental breakdown or develop a borderline personality disorder? What events in a person's life would have to happen for that to, for that to be the outcome? And the way I thought it would be the best mode to discover in that is memories. Um, they contain everything. When something happens to you, something drastic, you search for memory and you try and find the moment when that happened. When was the moment where things changed? Where was the shift? Do you know what I mean? And using memories as using memories as a device what allowed me to have a lot more fun with language. It allowed me to select very specific things that I wanted to write about. Um, and I personally feel like memories are the best way for you to get to know a person because I wanted the reader to know Kay. I wanted them to empathize with him and understand why he was making the decisions he was making, why he was doing the things he was doing. And it's, it's memory is how we get to know people. When you meet somebody for the first time or you go out with somebody and you want them to get to know you, what do you do? The best way to do it, you start reeling off things that have happened to you in your life or you start reeling off memories. If you lost your memory tomorrow, who are you then? You, you, you almost become a nobody. I did enjoy writing. It was, it was quite fun at times to write, to explore the, the psychology of this young boy as he grows into a man. Um, to explore outside of like, obviously mental health is a big part of it, but explore things like Ghanaian culture, explore family, um, you know, what it's like to have a brother when you're living in this real hyper-masculine world, you know, showing tenderness, how men show tenderness without actually being overtly tender, the little things that they do. I wanted to explore all of those things um, as well. Um, so yeah, it was, it was it was it was great fun. It was, it was a lot of fun to do. Mm. At the time that you were writing um, this story, what kind of propelled it? What was was there like an emotional function? The writing of Kay's life and the choosing of all these fragments served for you on a personal level. Yeah, I would wake up, I guess, in the morning and just think to myself, what 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 has happened in Kay's life today? Do you know what I mean? It would be like, what has happened to him? And what, that thing that's happened, how does it then affect his future behavior? So it was almost like a puzzle that I was piecing together in my mind every day that I woke up and I was deciding to write this book. Um, so that's really what propelled me, just the 
let me get to the end and see how it was all going to conclude. Because I didn't know how I was going to finish the book. Mm -hmm. Didn't know how it was going to end until I got to the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've just got the book. If you can turn, it's weird me telling you which page of your notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought maybe like a, an extract from the beginning to give readers a sense of, of your writing and, um, okay. and, and, and then maybe something that goes more deeply into some of the themes and that to untangle that you've, that you've kind of explored. Um, so maybe if you, you turn to pages um, four and five. London homes were closed to young foreboding darkness, and so were the doors of a family letting go of the past. Once I'm in care, my mum occasionally picks me up but can't recall how I got there. There's six of us, three who soak their beds, me looking on thinking they're confused as to which way their tears should flow, and two who stand with me in the bathroom, water running but clothes still on, forced hands down my trousers. I learned to clip my nails daydreaming about my foster mother trimming hers, the cut in her, index and thumb pressed into my lobe when I misbehaved. Or there was a raised cane, a light cracking sound, no atmospheric stomach rumble as I think back, a white hand raised to strike black skin. How can the truth of my love not begin to lose synergy? So facile, it was so, all so easily flammable. The jet left and my mom's hearty inhales were enough to spark my curiosity. So I watched my thumb give rise to light, delivering the dissolving tissue to the plastic bin with our leftovers. There wasn't enough time for ashes to be born, but I stepped back in awe of the flaming wings rising to the ceiling. The fire was out with air to spare, my foster mother's age containing a vitality that doused the flames, throwing a jug of water, then taking me to the fridge. She held onto my arm while cutting a scotch bonnet, then rubbed it into my face to burn off that troublesome nose and thick lips that talked back. I was in bed early, and as I tried to sleep, the dripping tap taunted me with promises of solace, but I stayed where I was and cried. In the morning, when I opened my eyes, the hot residue was gone. The bed for summer visits spoke with relief as my foster mother sat up, fully clothed, and looked at me. Dry, I felt no pain as I watched dense balls of fluff fall to the floor, and my foster friend, brother really, sweep them up, eager to be involved. He'd experienced a few cuts, but now his head's covered in scabs, suppressed hair, cultural significance dried up, so every time someone was getting a trim, there he'd be brim in hand waiting for the 4C weeds to tumble to the floor. I once watched him put my hair in his pocket and inhale it behind the door. My scalp had some sores too, but the plump tangle of my hair kept it a secret my 1A carers had no reason to wonder about. When the cut was over and I slid off the chair, immediately forgetting my fro, there were no puffs of hair to cushion my steps, the job of sweeping them away done so well. I felt lucky to only get the snips because I'd seen the fits of the suffering girls, soft hair falling like floss, no throat to swell, white hands going into black hair, but never acknowledging his curls. I wonder whether like, even when you didn't, um, even when you wasn't writing per se, obviously you, you were writing lyrics and you were doing other things, but were, did you kind of feel like that, that kind of, that you were kind of observing your own life happening when you were younger? And, and or, or what, is, what is it about uh, K slash yourself that you feel like you've drawn on to kind of like, weave these extracts um, and memories together yeah i don't <clears throat> i don't remember much from my um my childhood i remember it was it was a happy childhood it was quite idyllic well i was in foster care too but i don't remember being sad in foster care and anything like that mm. i think i wrote k to be it's it's not even observant it's just kind of trying to piece together memories mm. so everything that i've written in this book can be taken at face value or not, you know, mm -hmm. because every time you recall something, the memory changes. You'll never remember something as it factually happened. It's always mm -hmm. distorted in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. So you can literally add anything you want to it. So when you're trying to make sense of things, you're adding more and more detail because you're trying to hone in on something. It's like world building when you're remembering. All these details just fall into it. And then just because you really want to, you want an aha moment. Where, mm -hmm. oh, okay, this is it. Or you remember something and you don't understand why you remember it. So you, you fixate on the memory and just think, why is this significant? Again, your world building. Um, so that's, 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 that's what that was. Not mm -hmm. necessarily K being a young boy and just uh, watching absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. When, as, as the story kind of 
um, develops you, the extracts that you pick from Kay's life uh, focus a lot on his his relationship with his mom, his mm -hmm. biological mom. Um, so maybe because I'm going in and I've read it, I'm assuming everyone has an idea of the narrative. Maybe you could also like just briefly summarize the story of Kay. And when I'm explaining, it doesn't seem too left field to people. It's, it is difficult to summarize the book because there's, there's so much in there. Um, Kay's relationship with his mother is <clears throat> is fraught because obviously, you know, he was put in foster care, which is for a baby that's trauma. You know, it, um, and Kay's also British Ghanaian as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. British Ghanaian. Yeah. Um, so when a you know when a baby is born, it, it develops these attachments to its mother, the sound of her voice, the touch of her skin, the, her, her smells, and things like that. And then taking a baby away from that is trauma for the baby. Um, and then of course Kay growing up with another mum, and then being ripped away from her as well. So of course that's going to lead to a struggle with his with his biological mother. But it is, you can tell that it's just more about Kay wanting to be loved consistently by somebody. And we also, with borderline personality disorder, these are things that develop it in later life. You know, attachments being broken, being put in foster care. These are things that often cause, well, are connected to people who develop borderline personality disorder. So the way I tried to write it was that you get a sense that Kay really just wants somebody to love him, but he's unable to accept the love that he wants um, because he's scared that someone's going to abandon him again. Again, abandonment issues is a big part of borderline personality um, disorder as well. So that's why he's really struggles with his with his relationship with his his mother. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's any point in the book where you would think that Kay doesn't love his mother. Mm. You know, yeah. do you know what I mean, even and even his father as well. As um as I've written him, he's not a very likable character. Mm. But you can tell that Kay wants to love him. He mm. wants to be loved by him. He mm. wants to be accepted by him. Mm. Yeah, that that pulses throughout the book. His like kind of quest for love in the relationships he has and how that materializes so differently between his mom, his foster mom, his brother um which is also another like a, a powerful relationship in the book before case for some other dies he goes back and lives with with his family i believe and then i think he learns his foster mother dies um and when he's living with his family he's now living in um the broadwater farm um yes broader farm estate yeah estate um he's kind of living with his with his his brother then there's the london riots and how that's like kind of enveloped around around them and like this is where you kind of really see his and i think you see a lot about masculinity in that in that part of the book and then then he has a, a breakdown because he's self-harming um and he starts to i guess reconnect with his mom uh with his biological mother who as you say they have a relationship throughout uh the novel that goes through a journey and now the, mother, the mother's trying to kind of contend with who, with Kay and, and with Kay's mental health, yeah, his, uh, borderline personality disorder. And the, the book essentially ends on them all kind of grappling with that and, and how to kind of move on with that. Um, he's like, one of the things I found really striking about it is the way you, Ray, firstly, the way race is really clear from the beginning and his masculinity is really clear from the beginning. Um, there's an extract I'd, I'd like to find where he's playing um, in a playground at school and a, and a girl, um, I, I won't spoil the bits, I'll just, I'll just find it and, and get you to read it. I've got it. Yeah. Do you want me to read it? Yes, please. Okay. My first day of school, a boy in year six asked me if I'm a rude boy. I'm not rude, I think, and carry on watching the girls play marbles, waiting for the right moment to ask if I can join. I have a cat side, but they ask how I can see through my dark skin. On the second day, the only student who will talk to me tells me to undo my shirt's top button, roll up the sleeves and walk with a bop. 
There's no official school, school uniform, but secondhand shirts and trousers are cheaper than tracksuits, so I always look smart and ready to learn. And this, the boy informs me, makes me a bod. The transformation helps. On the third day, a girl in year six takes me around the corner, cups my face and kisses me. Her lips are soft, and as they press against mine, it feels like nectar from the pressure is trickling down my chin to branch, to branch out inside my chest, and suddenly, I love London best. After a few weeks, my classmates are less hesitant to talk to me, and soon even my teacher can address me without smirking at my clothes, my clogged shoes, or my constantly split bottom lip. I'm told my breath smells like an African. I take the insult with baptized eyes, seeing who I am, unable to rebut because as I lift my hand to cut my, to cut my mouth, I can smell last night's soup still on my fingertips. It's past lunchtime, so I lick them clean, unsure if I'm trying to savor the taste to subdue my speaking stomach, unsatisfied with the ham sandwich packed for lunch, while I'm embarrassed, revealed to be an African who he eats with his hands. Some days I try to play football, but I've never been picked because I do something called toe punt. So I sit behind the goal and dig a stick into the grass, trying to create a grave for the ants that pass by. Maybe I'll join their march. I'm still in love with the girl in year six. A teacher caught us pressed together behind a skip and I haven't seen the girl again. I'm in year three. So now I play with my sticks, watch the boys running around after the football and think about the next person who want to be my friend. I guess like growing up in the playground in London um, or going to school in London and like, you know, I know, I, and I guess maybe like you can speak to this, whether it's the same, similar for, for you um, and what you're drawing on with Kate. But yeah, like all the Africa jokes, all the stuff about especially like you're playing football, what African fo footballers are like, do you know what I mean? Like things like of that nature. And also just like how even when you're really young and you're not necessarily like race and obviously we live in a time where our awareness of, uh, of identity and the way it plays into our society is much higher than when we were children, at least, at least uh, for me. But like, you still had that kind of subconscious awareness of how that played into all the scenarios you you were in do you know what i mean um what what, what were you kind of like pulling on when you were kind of writing these k has come from another world and he's unaware that he's african that he's Ghanaian. in a way that in london if he was brought up in london he definitely would would have known you know and it, yeah, I, I did obviously think about what it was like for me growing up, you know, because when I was younger in school, you know, you weren't, I wasn't black, I was considered an African, you know, West Indians were black, mm -hmm. I was an African, and it, it just never made sense to me when I was young, it still doesn't make sense to me now, but mm -hmm. um, obviously this, these are these are kids. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, you, you were you were bullied for being, for being African, you know. And at the time, there was just so much negative reporting about the continent. So many, you know, negative portrayals on t in TV commercials and stuff like that. And kids would see them, watch them and think, oh, this is what Africa's like. This is an African in my school. Does he walk barefoot, like on the street and stuff like that? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They'll tease you, they'll cost you. This. I wanted to make sure that I put that in the book because sometimes when you talk about this, people are like, that didn't happen. You weren't mm -hmm. bullied in Africa. And I'm like, yeah, we were. We really, mm -hmm. really were. Um, so it's important for me to get that down on paper so mm -hmm. people don't forget that it actually did mm -hmm. exist, did happen. So interesting. You're so right that, like, there's such an erasure of those times now. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, even from calling out the register in school, do you know what I mean? Like, the way, <laughs> just, like, calling out African names, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, um, so much about what being African was was always derogatory, right? Like, obviously, we live in a com in not completely contrasting time, but now it's almost there. There is a more of at least within us, there's more of a reveling in our heritage, sort of thing. Yeah, it's amazing. Know? It's amazing to see now. You know, um, it's like you know, my my brother's generation. My brother's like eleven years younger than me, mm. and when I would hear when I hear him talk his friends talk when I'm outside on the street and stuff, mm. you know, there's, there's so much, um, pigeon English now woven mm. into, into mm. street slang. Mm. Jamaicans are, you know, some Jamaicans are now pretending to be Nigerian. Mm -hmm. like that back in the day, you know, <laughs> the other way around, but now yeah. it's to be Nigerian, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? 
so it's, it's amazing to see is the evolution mm. is, is 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 interesting mm, mm, definitely and we didn't have the same same cultural fabric around us to be proud in that that my younger sister your younger brother has mm -hmm. now you know like where the best the best music is often like in synergy with or with in a relationship with afro beats or mm -hmm. do you know what i mean um and and just like kind of pop culture icons that were then i remember when when i was in school and i don't know if you ever listened to style plus it's like a nigerian um uh i would say like kind of it was like a kind of early early afro beats like maybe around 2009 ish mm -hmm. um or, or even younger um or earlier and these were the kind of when people i remember at that time really loving style plus but i remember like that was a kind of wave of afro beats before the band and before like do you know what i mean p square when you like people who liked that, they were kind of like, oh, you like this kind of like weird music. Do you know what I mean? It was such a kind of, I remember quite vividly, people who liked, overtly liked the music too much being kind of seen as like, yeah, you kind of, you're in a bit of a niche. You fast forward even four or five years, and now it's become, the waves of Afrobeats has come since then, it's so much more mainstream and it's, it's like ubiquitous yeah. sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. You navigate something really well in the book in, kind of drawing out his Ghanaian identity um, and the, the different ways um, and the different stages of his life. And the novel um, is kind of interspersed with um, parts um, from uh, a character, um, Anansi. And maybe you can kind of talk about the, the kind of tradition of Ghanaian literature that you're trying to kind of intersperse through your book and what that's saying. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I had the element of the oral tradition, storytelling, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Anansi being the trickster god, but also the god of stories, you know, mm -hmm. the story goes that Nyame made him, the god of stories gave him all the stories. So it made sense for me to insert him in there. But then also he stands as a representation of Ghanaian culture mm -hmm. that Kay is trying to reach. So mm -hmm. Kay is saying prayers to Anansi, telling Anansi his story, hoping that he'll deliver them to Nyame, the sky god. Mm. Um, and I also wanted that to represent kind of, you know, a um, an inversion of, not an inversion, but a twisting of Christianity in that in order to speak to God, you must go through Christ, they say. So in order to, to speak to Nyame, he had to go through Anansi, you know, Anansi was mm -hmm. the middle ground. Um, but yeah, but also, yeah, just representing him really trying to connect with his Ghanaian culture, mm -hmm. storytelling, trying to tell a better story than a Nancy could tell, trying to own his own story, you know, trying to take control of it, saying, this is my story. And Nancy, you don't own my story. I own it myself, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things I was trying to do by a certain Anansi um, mm -hmm. to the narrative. In terms of, like, Ghanaian flipping between, like, progressing on Ghana, uh, his own personal identity and story, and then also religion, and then also like section, sexual discovery as well, um, and finally mental health. But with this, it's he is kind of on a journey. K is like older and on a journey, and is seemingly discovering stuff. So I'll let you, I'll let you read. Cool. I found porn between my dad's vinyls of Prince and Rick James. His plastic casing reminded me of pirated games, cheating companies. I was disgusted, bypassing arousal because I've never known sex, the pressure, the pulsing, the sweat and post revulsion. I felt close and that's what I want. I daydream of dissolving, reaching for you to join my disillusion. Dissolution. Our skin touching, I imagine we become who we'd like ourselves to be, but we're blocked, never really touching, scientifically speaking, and look, and look absurd while we're fucking. I've said I'd rather not, not tonight, but I know the mood swing will end in a fight. Manipulation out of sight. So I give in and ta I'm taken in. A smooth swallow, then rapturous applause. Building, only to plummet to slow palms. A sarcastic clap, a peak nearly reached. I climb the crescendo one more time. I feel like I'm going to die. Streaks and scratches on my chest. Shouts to go deeper, having nothing left. So out of breath, so out of my zone. And as I climax, I'm dreaming of being home. And then we're done. Both bereft, smouldering without satisfaction, a fire drained of air. 
Her bloodshot side eye makes me want to run and hide. She needs a man and I'm a boy. She wants to make love and I want to be in love. I imagine myself small, knees up, my temples against my caps and my arms wrapped around them. Foot, footsteps pass me and someone asks, but there's nothing wrong with me. I climb out of bed, pretending to scratch my pubic hair to conceal my flaccidity. I close the bathroom door with my head in my hands, feeling my, feeling my penis retreating, embarrassed by how we're leaving. I sit on the seat and cry. Which I thought was like one of the most powerful um, kind of depictions I've read in a novel of like sex and vulnerability from a ma from a man and obviously Kay is a black man and can maybe before like get into like questions about sex in in the story like what what were you what what's where is Kay right now at this point in the novel and what were you trying to kind of really like pull out here? So Kay is, yeah, he's, he's, I guess, a young man. Mm -hmm. um, what I really wanted to show there is, yeah, how masculinity works in terms of male sexuality mm -hmm. and how there are many, many masculinities, many ways to, many ways that men identify with sex. You know, we're not, of course, we're not all craven, sex hungry um, mm -hmm. guys and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. You know, a lot of us don't know. That's the dominant depiction, right? Like, so, yeah, yeah, that's the dominant depiction. Yeah, exactly. A lot of us don't know um, how to approach it or things that have mm -hmm. happened. So, there are obviously passages before that that I've tried to build up to the conclusion that K is uncomfortable with sex mm -hmm. because of things that have happened to him. Do you know what I mean? So, that's why I was really trying to um, convey. And of course, the, the, the pressure to perform as well mm. you know the pressure that every time you have sex it has to be amazing and mind-blowing mm. if not then you're 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 a loser you're terrible uh, you're 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 useless do you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. um and i think that's a you know that's a real that's an uncomfortable pressure you know mm -hmm. and um how guys deal with it varies from person to person but the way k deals with it is he just retreats into himself mm. even during the act he mm. can't he can't enjoy it because he's just overthinking it too much mm. 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 and she there is this you kind of really hone in on that vulnerability in the act because she kind of walks away and she is obviously frustrated and then kind of dismissive of however he's feeling because in that in that scenario he's only there to, to, to live up to the the act right sort of mm -hmm. thing um whereas he has to kind of contend with what that really means for him yeah yeah absolutely and mm -hmm. you know he's not he's not that he's not really interested mm -hmm. in in having sex mm -hmm. but he's doing it because he feels that that's what he's supposed to do mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that's what that's what she wants so he's mm -hmm. gonna he's gonna give it to her mm -hmm. um but you know I've tried to really just sum it all up is that, you know, she wants a man and he's a boy, you know, she wants to make love and he wants to be in love. And that mm -hmm. again is just symptomatic of Kay's development and what's happened to him and the fact that he just wants somebody to accept him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you were like writing it, did you feel like it was important to draw on really kind of visual imagery and uh, not rebel is the wrong word but do you know what i mean like kind of stay in the vulnerability of it to really kind of um uh illuminate it sort of thing you know like you there are bits of it where you talk quite vividly about uh just the way he he's kind of recoiling it concealing his facility with his knees up kind of it's a it's a really kind of like clear um and sad image of him doing that um, mm -hmm. and you're trying to kind of like i guess impress that right that like this the figure of the black man in sex is can be that uh, that, we're, that we're fed can actually very much be reduced to this because of that image sort of thing. Ab ab absolutely um again it's not just uh, pressure to perform mm -hmm. it's uh, pressure excuse me pressure to look a certain way mm -hmm. do you know what i mean and I wanted to, you know, when I wrote that, I did, I did laugh a little bit, mm. and I hope that I hope that someone else reading it would 
would laugh a little bit at that, even though mm. it's a sad section. Mm. Mm. But, you know, I feel like I hoped that people could relate to the fact mm. that, you know, post-sex, what you tend to do is you want to hide yourself. Mm. You don't want anybody to see, to see, your, to see yourself. Mm. I feel like mm. a lot of guys probably do that. Um, mm. I wasn't trying to be like too graphic or anything, you know, because mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I hate writing about sex. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. hate it. Um, <laughs> so you know, that was um, it wasn't difficult to write, but I mm -hmm. took I took a lot more time with that with that mm -hmm. that passage. Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can contrast that actually. If you if you go to that page sixty nine, after a late night library trip, I'd call her and say, "Look at the moon." Black boys rarely speak on the poet's muse, so these twilight tropes seemed original. The moon is glowing new when seen through eyes deprived of cliché. She's bent over the windowsill, leaning out into the stars, a speckled blanket. If she reaches out, it will be ours. When I walk into a piece that was never going to last. Her hair, the carefully trimmed ends tinged with colours, one close in hell reminding me of home, of all the unknown, unknown black girls through hair care I've known, glows, a luster unchallenged. Then the jealousy of the moon lights her up and dissolves the dimness of my room. It's all over her. She's illuminated. And this bathe of light reveals her lack of garments. Our eyes see through the ceiling as we lie with hands interlocked, talking into the day when the sun will want is turned to watch, rays on us as we fall in love. She turns onto her stomach and places a hand on my stubble, like pins in her palms, a sensation running up her arm, draws, draws me closer and I'm disarmed. And with a kiss, we're surrounded by nothing. What were you kind of drawing on when you were like writing about this and what's kind of swirling in, in Kay's life right now? This is as part of a series of, I guess, relationships or memories of different, um, different relationships she's had with that, with these, with those, um, sections, I was specifically trying to highlight the fact that with BPD, one of the main symptoms is that you go through a long string of unsuccessful relationships um you leave for whatever reason fear of abandonment but then obviously inside the verses i'm trying to do many other things as well i'm trying to highlight the fact that when it comes to poetry we have a lot of you know white authors who love well back in the day who love to write about the moon do you know what i mean and that's why i'm just like you know black boys really speak on the poet's muse mm -hmm. um, trying to do something new you know i'm trying to give us a voice in 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 that sense um and again, I, I'm just trying to make sure that the sense of love is pulsing throughout mm -hmm. the book, throughout Kay's interactions um, with other people. And you can just tell that this instance where he's just laying with somebody is so much more pleasurable to him than him mm -hmm. having sex with somebody. Mm -hmm. When you, um, uh, another aspect I want us to draw on also was on religion which obviously like growing up in the diaspora in the UK, a, a lot of us would have grown up religious. Um, uh, and, but his relationship with God and, and, and also again, like you've, you've talked about how you've used the Nazi um, within that goes for a bit of a journey. Um, so I wanted to kind of read a couple of extracts of that as well, um, uh, if you will. So, if you go to 54. Outside the eyes of God, there are no sins. I learned deceit when I decided to give my life to Christ. Timid, with a voice too weak to reach salvation, I was told to speak up and be heard, bounce my words off the drums of God, played by the young West Africa boy waiting for citizenship, but finding a home in church. My pastor, their daddy, told stories of sex, drugs, his first testimony, matrimony, and I'm sure, Years later, he's succumbing to infidelity. Sins are stories given to a Nancy to warn children at bedtime. <clears throat> a web of lies filled and taken over by locusts invading from across the sea. What didn't touch the brink of spiritual abuse was speaking off by gar gargling deacons as sipping on the devil's juice. I rested on community center seats as the horns of judgment bellowed from the throat of our leader. And in feeling no rapture, I knew it was over. I knew as I sat and soothed myself with musical force of consequence played out over inherent value that purple rain contained no trumpets. I smiled as all heads bowed for the closing prayer, mine containing only a thank you. I stood and turned my back to the pulpit, attentive to the standing of goodness without the worship of crucified statues. Mm. 
And so in a way, he, he seems like he's coming to this, he's come to a, a moment, right, where he's, he's realizing the <coughs> space that God has occupied in his life growing up in as a kind of West African boy, as you put it in the extract. And now the space, it, it no longer was going to, it was no longer able to kind of do what it was meant to do, right? Absolutely, yeah. You know, as I, as I, as I wrote in the book, you know, Kay's relationship with religion is through his mother. Do you know what I mean? And it's it's like that for a lot of people. You know, it was it was like that for me as well. And you just there is usually a moment, and I try to capture that in, in in that passage where you're just kind of like, "What am I doing here? Do I actually believe this?" You know. And I do find that you know I've spoken to a lot of Christians that they have those moments. They leave and then they find Christ themselves, mm-hmm. rather than through them their parents forcing them to go to church, mm-hmm. and. When that happens, their relationship with God is a lot stronger because it's not based on anything other than their own decision to to enter mm-hmm. the church, to, to mm-hmm. give their life to Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, that's not Kay's journey. Mm-hmm. Um, but he can he can still, he can't detangle, I would call it indoctrination. He can't detangle mm-hmm. himself from that. Mm-hmm. So in everything that he goes through, still there are callbacks to god or christ or, or things like that do you know what i mean mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know like i i really found like like some lines to zero in on that just like the purpose of of what the church served right like uh, the in the first parts where you say uh, bounce my words off the drums of god played by the young west african boy waiting for citizenship but finding a home in the church and it made me think a lot about how our parents generation church was also in the in in the west and in the uk a place where a primary concern was being put to god right for like permanent stay and and how the quest for citizenship in a sense made church you know kind of more important sort of yep. thing because this was a place of safety but also a place where we were trying to achieve that permanence in this like new place i guess the different ways in which church was a kind of conduit for other things but also like kind of this place of like hypocrisy and conflict conflicting things right exactly and so just a 79 uh, sorry 78 and 79 reading the symptoms felt like reading the traits of my sign my understanding of mental health ailments was limited to depression and multiple personality disorder and anything outside of this cinematic understanding sounded like an excuse for careless behavior i did wonder about the truth where do I begin and BB, BPD stops? Imagine living a life in which who you are feels like a prop. The printouts came 18 years after I needed them and watching my hand tremble with the page, the specialist reached out and told me the older I get, the fewer the traits. But for the bodies lying drained, piled up on the path to his office, this news has come too late. Seems like he's kind of grappling with the impact this thing has have happened in his life, have, has had on him in his life. Which is only just belatedly learning about, right? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it is, and you know, BPD affects other people. It affects so many other people in your life. So you may be relieved when you get the diagnosis and say, "Okay, this is what's wrong with me." But what about all of the other people you've affected in the past? Where's their relief? You know. So that's what I was trying to say. You know, it's just come eighteen years too late you know what about the bodies piled up what about all the people that he's hurt because of the manifestations of of the disorder that can be quite extreme at times as well do you know what i mean um so that's just i guess an open open open-ended question in there you know i I don't know how to answer that you know in my own personal experience is that if i felt like bpd has affected someone in my past i've reached out to them and and spoke to them and said you know did you think I was behaving erratically? So and we've had a conversation about it. It's always, it's always been fruitful. Um, but obviously that's not K, not something K has the opportunity to do. Mm. Well, what would you say is like, because there's, there's much more awareness on mental health as a kind of gen- umbrella term. Mm-hmm. But obviously within that umbrella term, there are some things that have more kind of awareness, that we are more aware of as a society than others. Do you, do you think like BPD is like under, um, not very as not as well understood maybe as like depression or anxiety absolutely i mean even with with this, the science with the research they, they don't know that much about it and their ideas of it are changing all the time 
there's a lot of misinformation on the internet about it there's a lot of horrible articles written about it people with it the depictions in the media in movies are usually awful you know people are made out to be like just really really horrible people like you don't want to be around them because they have borderline personality disorder but the reality is it's not like that people who have the disorder are vulnerable you know they're they're not always in control their behavior changes because they can't regulate their emotions properly they have all of these things going on i believe there's nine there's nine symptoms of it so all of these things need to be taken into consideration and it's not information that's easy to find well simple a sympathetic information and really informative information is not easy to find so we definitely need to learn mm -hmm. more about it and hopefully my book does provide some insight into what it's like to live with the disorder what you what you do is is such a with with k obviously the aspects that are biographical to some extent like bpd do you feel like and, I, and, I, and what i what i what i felt reading it was how striking it was to read about bpd in quite an explicit way um at points obviously this is happening in the foreground in the background and it, become, it, it comes to the foreground and and by the end of the novel and such it how he's dealing with trauma and how he's dealing with his, his uh, mental health is such a, uh, a visceral um, um, depiction there. And there's a lot there, a lot of vulnerability and a lot of um, contending with that. And that's quite powerful to see in a, in a black character and a black male character mm -hmm. as well. Um, uh, so yeah, just wanted to like commend you for that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess we've spoken about mental health sort of last, but and, and whilst that's a, a powerful thread through the book, I felt like there was so much there, do you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. that we kind of touched on um, that was equally worth exploring, like uh, love and sex and uh, his mum, which definitely for readers, it, the relationship with, his, with both of his mothers, um, uh, which, and, and also uh, the city, the contrast between the kind of, what seems like the kind of volatility and brutality at times of the city against the kind of serenity and um retreat of like kind of like rural life mm -hmm. it seemed yeah. that that was also a kind of thing and and just the way in which you kind of you mix that in as well with like the imagery around uh more kind of things that are more synonymous with like greek mythology or like kind of classic um symbols um was super powerful um thank you uh, yeah it was a triumph obviously you it it, it was awarded and rightfully so. Um, and your journey as a writer is super exciting. And I'm sure people who read this um, and read more of your work will be as excited too. And yeah, I just want to say that it's been a pleasure. Um, Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. I really you appreciate know. that. Yeah. So yeah, all, all the best. And um, yeah, look forward to kind of like seeing what you do in the future. Great. Thank you. place to go you can join me in the world of words let me seems like i'm nowhere to be found if you look you'll find me in a book let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix let's float around the moon you'll never be alone now you know Find me, find you, find the world in the book Never be alone, now you know where to look Find me, find you, find the world We don't just think of ourselves as a bank. Uh, we think of ourselves as corporate citizens with responsibility for growing the economy. Reading and education is a key part of it. But equally important is having access to reading materials uh, at home. A lot of the intervention we've done throughout this COVID is to ensure that people can safely navigate the uncertainties of the COVID crisis and come out of it ready for, you know, to leave again. Let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix. Let's float around the moon. The dreams that we have are limited by what we have directly interacted with. 
What reading does is it makes it possible for you to begin to live in worlds that don't yet exist. One read creates a discipline of reading. One read puts me on a timeline. It gives me an important book and I have an opportunity to read it and to collaborate. It's almost like having someone who does your book selection for you. If you have editors and people who are really good at this saying to you, this is the book for the month, I, I value that. I want to be able to read in a community. I want reading to be a collaborative thing. I want reading to be a communion. And one read allows me to do that. I will use one read any day, any time. I was very excited when I got the call because it, it's a new frontier. Every chance to create is, 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 uh, is beautiful. And so to have the opportunity to create a theme song for something I actually care about, it's, it's, it's a perfect combination. If you ever need a new place to go, you can join me in the world of words. First, create a melody. Melodies are usually what make songs, as they say, sweet. And so that is where I started from. I, I tried to find something that merged the, the folk sound I'm used to, but also sprinkle a bit of the African spirit in there. Then it seems like I'm nowhere to be found. If you look, you'll find me in a book. With the lyrics for the songs, a lot of times when I was younger, when you didn't find me anywhere, I was very likely in my room reading a book. Let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix. Let's flow around the moon. Reading is a big part of my person and I'm also a writer, so it all just comes together. The best thing about reading and what, what's really important about it is that it helps us become who we should be. With reading, we become many things. We become empathetic to people. Stories that are not ours, we get to experience. And I feel like that is one thing that makes you a well-rounded human being. It's extremely important to read the work of other African writers that are not Nigerian or from my nationality because it's, it's a beautiful uh, mix of finding home and visiting a new place all in one. Never be alone, now you know where to look. Find me, find you, find the world. One read is an app I would use, I will use. Stranger's Guide is not a typical American travel magazine. Our mission is to dive deep into a single location, commissioning work from great writers and photographers, famous individuals, as well as up and coming new voices. This year, we decided to go to Lagos. And we are proud of the volume we produced with original work from some of Nigeria's best writers and photographers, working with luminaries like Wale Soinka, Molara Wood, and Femi Kute. We think this is a very special volume, and we're so excited to bring it back to Lagos. Madness only you can understand. Spectre. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre loans in five minutes.
Don't ruin your special moment. Shop now. Outmore.